Greetings. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Charco. I'm a professor of geography and international affairs at the George Washington University. And today we'll be talking about Ethiopian immigrants who have settled in the Washington metropolitan area, long considered an immigrant gateway. So let's start off with the story of immigration to the United States. The United States has been an area to which immigrants have been coming for hundreds of years, but the earliest immigrants were all from Europe, uh, primarily England and Germany and Western European countries. Now this changed in 1965 with the Hart Seller Act, which changed the global quotas for immigrants to quotas for Eastern and Western hemispheres, 170,000 for the Eastern hemisphere and 120,000 for the Western hemisphere. As a result of the abolition of individual country quotas that were in existence before, more and more immigrants from places like Asia, Latin America, and later on Africa started coming to the United States. And today, over 80% of all immigrants to the country are from these continents. The United States has policies that give preferences to relatives of US citizens. This is through the Family Reunification Program. Also, it prefers skilled workers and professionals, but also allows refugees to come into the country with green card visas, that is, they are permanent residents, allowing them to settle and live in the area. So over the years, from 1910 until uh, now, the percentage of the US population that is foreign born has changed. In 1910, it was about 15%. It dipped below 10 during the wars, but today it's back up to about 13%. Talking about push and pull factors for Ethiopian immigrants to the Washington metropolitan area, we know that push factors are the factors and conditions at home that cause people to leave their home country, in this case, Ethiopia. Pull factors, on the other hand, are those that draw or pull people from their home countries to the destination country which in this case is the United States. In Ethiopia, in 1974, there was a Marxist revolution that was very bloody. It was followed by a civil war. And in the 1980s, Ethiopia went through years of drought and famine, which caused many Ethiopians to leave the country. In fact, they left in droves. We know that about 1.2 million people died as a result of the drought and famine between 1983 and 1985, and 400,000 refugees left the country. So these were push factors for the Ethiopians. What pulled them to the United States? Well, the promise of safety and security, as well as economic opportunity that the United States offered to anybody who decided to come to uh, the country. But of course, there are complicating factors. The United States is pretty far from Ethiopia, so there is the cost of getting here as well as the distance of getting here. But along with the pull factors, there were legislations that actually facilitated the movement of Ethiopians to the United States. For example, in 1980, the US government created the Federal Refugee Resettlement Program. And to date, about third, 3 million refugees have been resettled in the United States. And in 1990, the US government created the Diversity Visa Program, which allows people from countries that traditionally did not send large numbers of immigrants to enter the country on this visa, which is also known sometimes at, as the Lottery Visa. So here we are looking at a graph that shows uh, the, the immigrants from Ethiopia uh, 
divided up into refugees, regular immigrants, as well as African refugees. So when you look at the graph and you look at the yellow lines and the blue lines, you see that from the early 80s right until about 1991, the lines are almost similar, which means that practically all the refugees from Africa who came to the United States during this period belonged to uh, the category of Ethiopian refugees. After that, of course, as other countries became uh, problematic for people to live there due to political strife and other reasons, uh, folks started leaving countries such as Sudan and Ethiopia was not as important an area uh, as a sending area for refugees. So once people started arriving in the United States, where did they go? Typically, people go to the metropolitan areas, the large cities. Some, such as New York and Los Angeles and Chicago, uh, San Francisco, have long attracted immigrants from all over the world. In fact, New York continues to be the number one metro with the highest number of foreign born about 29%. Washington metropolitan area, on the other hand, did not figure in the list of immigrant magnets for a long time. It was only starting in the 1980s that Washington started receiving immigrants from various parts of the world. Today, however, the Washington metropolitan area has about 1.4 million foreign born accounting for 23% of uh, the foreign born population, and it ranks seventh among all the metros in the United States. In this graph, we see that the foreign born population in the Washington metropolitan area has grown exponentially since 1970. In fact, with each decade, at least from 1970 to 2000, between one decade and the next, the population of foreign born seems almost to double. So we can see that this is going extremely rapidly. And now it is fairly high at 1.4 million foreign born, but growing somewhat more incrementally. The foreign born in the Washington metropolitan area come from all over the world. In fact, we often say that the Washington metropolitan area is hyper diverse. People come from over 180 countries to the Washington area. And if we divide them by the countries from which they come, the slice, as you can see on this pie chart, uh, that is the highest is 14% from the country of El Salvador. So this is unlike other cities where often Mexicans form the largest group of immigrants. We can see that there are several countries here with between six and 3% uh, of the foreign born population. And Ethiopia at 3% ranks along with Peru and Bolivia and Guatemala and Honduras but it isn't that much different from the 2% countries or even the 4% countries. So you can see that each of these wedges is only slightly larger in some cases than the others. If we focus on immigration from Africa, African immigrants comprise 14% of all immigrants to the Washington metropolitan area. And if we look at the smaller pie chart to the right, we can see that of these African immigrants, Ethiopians form the largest group, comprising 22% of all foreign born from Africa in the Washington metropolitan area. So as you can see, the Ethiopians are very well represented. So if we go through a timeline of when the Ethiopians started coming to Washington DC and its suburban areas, we can go back to 1970s when the Ethiopians who lived in the Washington area were mostly concentrated in the District of Columbia in Washington DC. 
they were largely the elite, they were well to do. Some of them were university students who had been drawn to universities in the nation's capital, but particularly Howard University, which is known as a premier institution for African Americans. As I mentioned, in 1974, there was a civil war and a Marxist coup, and Ethiopians, especially the well-educated and well-off Ethiopians, started to flee the communist regime that took over after the emperor, Haile Selassie, was deposed. And this was partly because this communist regime was very repressive and actually started imprisoning and killing intellectuals and people that they perceived were well off. The fact that we had the Refugee Act in 1980, which routinely allowed 50,000 refugees to enter the country each year, was also helpful. In fact, between 1982 and 1991, about 93% of African refugees to the United States were from Ethiopia as well as Eritrea. And between 1980 and 2000, approximately 17,000 Ethiopian refugees were admitted to the United States. As I mentioned before, the Immigration Act of 1990 with its diversity visa program was also helpful because under the auspices of this program, 50,000 green cards were issued yearly to people from all over the world uh, who could get their green cards through this program starting in 1995. Ethiopians got here through step migration as well as chain migration, which you would have read about in your class. Step migration is when you don't go directly from your country of origin or your home village or town to your destination, but make stops along the way. And because of huge internal displacement, uh, many of the refugees who ultimately came to the United States may have had to stop along the way, both within their country, as well as in places in Africa before they made the final leg of the journey to the United States. Chain migration is when people follow immigrants who have left their hometown or home city or village to go to a particular place, and then others follow in their wake. Because of the US government's policy stressing the importance of family reunification, a lot of the chain migration occurred after the initial immigrants and refugees became citizens, allowing them to sponsor their close relatives to come into the United States. This initial cohort of refugees, as I mentioned, was highly educated, the elites in their home country, and relatively affluent, although the later immigrants, such as the refugees, clearly were not. So this shows you some of the characteristics or traits of the Ethiopian population in the Washington metropolitan area. They are still largely foreign born, about 77%. Uh, most of them entered the country after the year 2000. About a third of them speak English less than very well. Most of them do, especially if they've had a high school education because um, English is taught in high schools and middle schools in Ethiopia. A fifth of them have bachelor's degrees, which is quite good. And 11% of them have graduate or professional degrees, which is on par with the native population. They are mostly wage and salary earners, and these people could go from minimum wage workers all the way to professionals, uh, such as doctors and lawyers. But again, there's about 11% that are self-employed. Their median household income is not great, but it's not shabby either. And their homes that they own are cost about uh, or are valued at about $300,000 in the Washington metropolitan area. So generally speaking, where do immigrants settle? To the left, you can see an image 
of the Washington metropolitan area. And right at the heart, right at the core, you see the District of Columbia, which is the lighter uh, diamond-shaped area. But this is surrounded by inner suburbs and outer suburbs, which are part of states such as Virginia, Maryland, and even West Virginia. As immigrants started moving into the Washington metropolitan area in larger and larger numbers, so we can see that most of them actually settle in the suburban areas rather than in the central city of Washington, D.C. So if you look at the graph on the right, you can see that the little red bar uh, changes slightly from decade to decade, whereas the suburban bar, which is depicted in blue, is rising rapidly, showing that this is where most of the immigrants are actually settling. This is another image showing suburban settlement. And again, we're looking at the District of Columbia, which forms most of that uh, diamond-shaped central area. But the darker areas that you see, both to the north, going to the northwest, and to the south and southwest, are areas we, where you have the most foreign-born populations. And these populations, of course, include Ethiopians. Geographers have found that today, immigrants do not tend to settle in the central city, but move to the suburbs because it's cheaper there. They can buy larger houses with lots. But at the same time, they are able to maintain community and stay in touch with each other, even though residentially they are very dispersed. So this is called heterolocality which says that recent immigrant populations who have a shared ethnic identity, when they come to an area from a distant country, adopt a dispersed pattern of residential location, unlike in earlier decades when people concentrated and clustered in areas like Chinatown and Little Italy, but that they remain connected to each other through religious institutions, secular institutions, through celebrations and all kinds of cultural activities. But this is just to let you know that the numbers of people from Ethiopia in the Washington metropolitan area have changed enormously. I'm going to go back for a little bit and take a look at the previous slide where we can see that the US Census for 2000 says that about 70,000 people from Ethiopia live in the United States, and of these, about 15,000 are in the Washington metropolitan area. A decade later, that number has increased more than twice. Uh, it's 154,000, and of these, about 30,000 live in the Washington metropolitan area. Today, that number is estimated to be about 50,000. But even these numbers are disputed by people such as the officials from the Ethiopian embassy in Washington, DC, and local ethnic organizations who say that this number of Ethiopians in the Washington metropolitan area can actually be as high as 100,000 to 200,000. Regardless, we know that Washington DC is the primary city of settlement for Ethiopians, accounting for about 19% of the entire population of people of Ethiopian heritage living in the United States. But there are also other cities in the United States that have large numbers of Ethiopian immigrants. These include Los Angeles, Columbus, Atlanta, Minneapolis, Seattle, Dallas, and of course, New York City. So why are Ethiopians settling in Washington DC rather than say New York City or Los Angeles? Why does the Washington metropolitan area have the largest Ethiopian population? Mm -hmm. 
This is because the initial nucleus, the initial cluster of Ethiopian immigrants, which if you remember, I had said happened to be students, professionals, and so on, lived in Washington, DC. And as people started arriving as immigrants and as refugees, they were drawn to this initial cluster because there were services, there were a few restaurants and cafes, there was ethnic community in these areas. Initially, the refugees were not settled in the, in the area at all. In fact, most of them were in California. But through the process of internal migration between the states, many of them left the areas where they were initially settled and moving uh, across the path country decided to settle in the Washington metropolitan area. A lot of this is driven by the Ethiopian immigrants' perceptions and views of Washington, D.C. as the ideal place to settle. In Ethiopia, it is the capital of Addis Ababa that everybody wants to go to and everybody wants to live in. And for the immigrants as well, they felt that the nation's capital would be the best place for them to be because of its centrality and clout. When we think of ethnic neighborhoods and enclaves, usually we think of areas where a particular ethnic group has settled and clustered, uh, again, giving rise to what we today would call ethnic enclaves such as Chinatown or Little Italy. To serve the, the people who settled in these areas, the residents, Oftentimes you have ethnic businesses crop up, and these again could be markets, restaurants, stores of all kinds, businesses, institutions, churches, mosques, and so on. Today, on the other hand, we find that, as I mentioned, there is less residential clustering. Nevertheless, if we look very closely at the central core of the Washington metropolitan area, Washington DC and the areas just around it, the darker areas on this map show that within the District of Columbia, the Ethiopians initially settled in the areas of Adams Morgan and Mount Pleasant, and also to the north in Brightwood. Across the boundary of the district in Maryland, they settled in Silver Spring and Tacoma Park, Whereas to the south in Virginia, they had concentrations in Arlington County, in Alexandria, and even in the Columbia Pike area. As more and more Ethiopians started settling in the Washington metropolitan area, they started creating their own businesses, first to serve the local population of ethnics, ethnic uh, Ethiopians that is. But later, some of their businesses and especially their restaurants and cafes would serve a larger population that included everybody living in the metropolitan area. We know that immigrants in general are more predisposed to, to be entrepreneurial and to start their own businesses. And this could be because uh, sometimes the degrees they get in their home countries are not valued or recognized in the destination country. It could be because they lack the language skills, but it could also be that some of these businesses that start by catering to the ethnic population could also hire ethnic fellow Ethiopians and it was more conducive for them to start small within the community. In addition to the restaurants and cafes and so on, in the Washington metropolitan area, Ethiopians are known to own taxi businesses and for driving taxis. In fact, if you come to Washington DC and decide to take a cab, it's quite likely that the cabbie will be of Ethiopian descent. Ethiopians have what is called an occupational niche in the Washington metropolitan area of driving cabs, which means that they are overrepresented in this occupation than in than any other group. 
Ethiopians are also engaged in the real estate business and in import and export businesses. And by 2011, the Ethiopian Yellow Pages found that there were at least 1,200 businesses owned by ethnic Ethiopians spread across the inner and outer suburbs of Washington, D.C., in Northern Virginia and Maryland. The figures that you see here are of Meskarem at the top, uh, one of the first Ethiopian restaurants to set up shop on 18th Street in Adams Morgan. If you remember from the previous map, Adams Morgan was one of the areas where Ethiopians settled. But soon they also moved to other areas which we will talk about, including U Street. And to the right, you could see this brightly colored yellow building. This is the home of the office of the Ethiopian Yellow Pages. But there were also a rash of restaurants on U Street, such as Salome Ethiopian Restaurant, which is to the bottom left. Now, Ethiopian businesses, when they started moving to the U Street area, were actually very helpful to the city because they started refurbishing old buildings that had been boarded up since the 1960s, since the late 1960s. In fact, this is the area that felt the brunt of the riots in the wake of the assass assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And they remained in this state for many decades. But starting in the 1990s, Ethiopians started renting these places, uh, doing them over, setting up shop. And what you can see to the left is an enterprise that is still boarded up, but now you have places like the Aksum Ethiopian restaurant and a music store that have been established by Ethiopians in and off the U Street area. So this map shows the U Street area, which may not be very clear to you unless you really zoom in, but the inset to the right shows that just on 9th Street uh, and between U and T, in 2004, there were six Ethiopian restaurants and many more on U Street. So you can see that there is a clustering of businesses and restaurants and cafes in the area, even though the people, the Ethiopian immigrants themselves, did not live over here. Now, because of this clustering of commercial enterprises, Ethiopian leaders felt a great desire to cre create something that they called Little Ethiopia on Ninth Street where all of these commercial enterprises and restaurants were located. They started an online petition, which garnered hundreds and thousands of people who said this was a good idea. They got the support of a local city council member, but all of this came to naught because local African-Americans felt that this was a historically important area for them. In fact, U Street used to be called the Black Broadway. And during a time of segregation, you had lots of thriving African-American businesses here. And the African-Americans in the area felt that they did not want this historic area overshadowed by another uh, ethnic group but also reminded the Ethiopians that even though they had their commercial enterprises here, they actually mostly lived in the suburban areas of Washington, DC. Now, Washington, DC started regaining people. People started coming into the city starting in the late 1990s and certainly in the early 2000s. And as they came and places started getting gentrified, you will see that the impact, the visual impact, the actual impact that Ethiopian businesses had in neighborhoods 
diminished over time. So to the left, you see a location, 24 9 18th Street, which is in Adams Morgan, an area where Ethiopians lived uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. And there are at least four stores here that are Ethiopian. There's a music store called Ethiopia Sound. There is the Fana Travel Agency, an Ethiopian travel agency. There's a unisex hair salon, uh, which we know is Ethiopian because of the writing in Amharic. And up and down the street, up and down 18th Street, there were many, many Ethiopian owned enterprises. So we fast forward to 2020, we are looking at the same area and all of the Ethiopian businesses have vanished. In fact, Ethio Sound is replaced by a hookah bar. Uh, the, the hair salon has been replaced by a massage parlor and the travel agency has been replaced by a Tibetan shop. Similarly, Meskarim, which I mentioned, was one of the first Ethiopian restaurants to be established in the District of Columbia and had a run of several decades, had to close down as rents became too expensive for the owners to continue their businesses. And today where Meskarim used to stand, we have Copacabana, which is a sports bar with a Brazilian theme which also offers food, but it is certainly not Ethiopian. We find that Ethiopians have made a mark in Washington DC and in suburban areas by establishing places of worship. It is typical for immigrants who are new to an area to use rented space even in an area in a location or a building that is secular in nature so you might have what are called storefront churches so areas that are just used on sundays for example that it might even be in a mini mall as they establish themselves and as their populations and congregations grow and uh, they have more money they might buy a place and have the church uh, established there so to the left, you see an Ethiopian evangelical church. But if you look more closely, you will see a menorah on the window above the entryway. And this is because this was an old synagogue. As the Jewish people in the area left, they no longer wanted to have a synagogue in the city. And the Ethiopians brought, bought over the synagogue and converted it into a church. It's not just churches uh, that are located in the Washington metropolitan area. There are at least 12 of these uh, that can be Orthodox churches, evangelical churches, and even Catholic churches. There are also mosques that the Ethiopian Muslims frequent. And also there are a few Ethiopian Jews who have come to the Washington metropolitan area, even though most of them when they left Ethiopia, went to Israel. Another way in which the Ethiopians make a mark in the nation's capital is through their food. So Ethiopian food is believed to be healthy. It is, uh, you can have vegan options, you can have vegetarian options, uh, and certainly there's a lot of meat and fish in, in the cuisine. And of the various cuisines that are offered in the Washington metropolitan area, Ethiopian food ranks along with Vietnamese food as the ethnic food that everybody should try. So here you see the interior of a restaurant with paintings and murals on the wall. Uh, some of them are of Addis Ababa, some of them are of rituals and ceremonies conducted by Ethiopians. And then you also have markets and cafes where you can get your injera, which is the flatbread that Ethiopians eat, uh, or any of the Ethiopian delicacies that you can buy, take away, or in some instances actually eat on the premises. So what can we say about the Ethiopian immigrant population in the Washington area today? We know it continues to grow, but not as rapidly as in the earlier decades. 
but most of the growth is not from refugee movement. It's through family reunification and chain migration. Like other immigrants, we know that Ethiopians tend to live in the suburban areas. Although they do have clusterings of businesses, both in DC as well as in suburban areas. So the clustering is commercial rather than residential. We know uh, that the Ethiopians are extremely proud of their heritage and the knowledge that their ancestors were able to fight out uh, European co colonialists, uh, such as the Italians who they lost to in 1935, but they took back their country in 1941 and remained one of Africa's independent countries early uh, in the 40s, whereas most other African countries only achieved independence in the 60s. The colors of the Ethiopian flag were popular, popularized by Rastafarians and also later taken up by black musicians. And it's often considered a symbol of black unity. It's used on clothing, it's used on accessories and decorative items. And the Ethiopians are extremely proud of this. As Ethiopians have continued to live in the Washington area. Now we have not just first generation immigrants, that is new immigrants coming from Ethiopia, the foreign born, but also second and even third generation immigrants who are now Americans. They often think of themselves as American or if they have a hyphenated identity, it would be as Ethiopian uh, American. And also, as time goes by, there's greater identification with the local African-American population, as well as the African-American population in the country at large. So the image that you see is uh, a mural of Nipsey Hussle, who is a rapper. He is not Ethiopian. Uh, he lived in Los Angeles and died due to gun violence. But we know that an Ethiopian group has commissioned this mural because the writing on top is in Amharic, the language of uh, Ethiopia. And so as we look through the decades, it is very evident that Ethiopian immigrants are becoming Americans in every way possible, that they continue to be proud of their heritage, but are equally proud of being Americans. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. <laughs>